Hello, I'm Megan Winant, and today I'm going to be talking to you about The Fountain, which was directed by Darren Aronofsky. Now, Aronofsky is an American director, producer, and screenwriter. He's widely known for his thought-provoking filmmaking, which often has surrealistic and disturbing themes. He was born in New York and grew up in a Jewish family. He got into cinema late and didn't consider being a filmmaker until he became a student at Harvard University. He made his first featured film um, as a psychological thriller called Pi. It was actually pretty successful and earned him several awards. The Fountain is considered to be one of the most confusing and worst movies ever created. And it's actually developed a bad rap amongst audiences. The project began in 2000 after Aronofsky's indie hit, Requiem for a Dream. The initial budget was around $70 million. And to, an, to obtain that amount of money for such an unconventional film, Aronofsky had to collect it from multiple sources. He knew that he also needed to get a big name to help um, get funding, so he sent Brad Pitt the script. And when Pitt finished reading the script, he was actually moved to tears and decided to sign on. After that, Warner Bros. fast-tracked the movie with Kate Blanche as the second lead. Before filming, Aronofsky took his crew to Central America to actually learn more about the culture from Moises Morales Marquez, a scholar of Mesoamerican culture. While they were there, they toured the ruins of Palenque and flew to the Mayan rooms of Taka in Guatemala. Then they went to Australia, where the initial version was um, slated to film. And the cost that accumulated from the travel and research is actually what caused Aronofsky to film in Australia versus filming in Guatemala. During production, um, well, pr during pre-production, Village Roadshow Productions actually backed out because of script-related issues. And then seven weeks before filming was scheduled to, scott, scheduled to start, Brad Pitt actually left the movie for similar reasons. After Pitt left, the movie essentially folded, and Aronofsky had to lay off the entire crew. To distract himself from such a huge failure, he traveled to India and China and eventually went home to New York City, where he spent his days playing hours of Xbox. He couldn't let go of the fountain and actually had a graphic novel commissioned, which was released in 2005 through DC. After this, the unmade movie still kept coming into the, his thoughts and haunting him. So he actually decided to do a two-week rewriting period and decided to restart productions. And his rewriting period actually cut the budget in half to about $35 million, and then he took it back to Warner Bros. Eventually, New Regency Productions stepped in to co-fund the film, and he was able to rehire the crew and actually start production this time. When the film started rolling, um, unfortunately, Kate Blanche was working on another project, but um, Aronofsky had brought in Hugh Jackman after seeing his performance on Broadway in The Boy From Oz. And Jackman actually suggested that they bring in Rachel Wise in Kate Blanche's place. Due to the smaller budget, they also had to move shooting to a soundstage in Montreal. While Aronofsky didn't get the realism that he wanted, he did gain having full control of his set 
and keeping Warner Bros. happy and on board with the project. In order to achieve some of the awe-inspiring effects that surround Astro Tom's ship, Aronofsky hired Peter Parks, who is a marine biologist and photographer, to photograph a variety of chemicals, which they then projected around the ship to create the outer space effects. While this was significantly cheaper than actually getting industrial lights and magic to do the special effects, Warner Bros. actually reviewed this reel like five to six times before they approved the use of the chemical reaction photos rather than the special effects. And towards the end of the movie, they had pretty much no money to hire other actors, so some of the crew had to pull double duty and be used as background actors. When the film was finally released, um, it actually didn't do that well. Reviews make or break films, and Leslie Felprina's 2006 Variety review of the show, um, in Aronofsky's mind, is the reason that the movie tanked. He stated that she was personally attacking him rather than reviewing the movie based on its own merits. He thought that they might not enjoy the movie because people do not like to contemplate morbid topics like the ones that are presented in The Fountain. The movie follows three different stories, uh, one from the past, present, and future. Now, all of these men are in pursuit of an eternity to spend with their love. A Spanish conquistador in Mayan country is searching for the tree of life to free his captive queen. A medical researcher is working with various trees looking for a cure that will save um, his dying wife. And a space traveler who is traveling with an aged tree encapsulated in a spaceship that oddly resembles a bubble. He's traveling to a dying star that is wrapped in a nebula. And this traveler, who could possibly be the scientist 500 years in the future, is seeking an eternity with his love. The present-day surgeon is named Tom Creo, and he's obsessed with a medical research project um, with unlikely side benefits. Um, this project is essentially his last hope to save his wife. The research is actually based on a code that his wife Izzy has been researching concerning the conquistador Tomas. Tomas has been searching for the Mayan tree of life for the Spanish crown. In the future, the tree itself, or possibly Tom's wife, who was somehow turned into the tree itself, appears to be dying, which space traveler Tommy is exploring. These stories are all parallels and intersect with each other in strange ways. The quests both fail and succeed simultaneously. These stories and images represent the meditation of life and death, focusing on the myths that surround the Mayan tree of life that supposedly bestows immortality to all who drink its sap. This movie depicts extremely heavy moral themes. In all three timelines, the main character is searching for a way to become immortal. Present day Tom even actually goes to the extreme of saying, Death is a disease. It's like any other. And there's a cure. A cure. And I will find it. During each of their quests for immortality, these men come to the brink of losing their humanity, but their journeys end with them all dying. In the end, Tom eventually comes to terms with the fact that death is a part of life and that there is no way to cure it. This movie is comprised of four different genres, all which help to further along the message that Aronofsky seems to be conveying. 
The romance and drama presented in the film allows us to see Izzy accept the fact that she's going to die. Even though she hasn't finished writing the last chapter of her book, she tells Tom that she wants him to finish it and that she's not afraid of dying anymore. Izzy found beauty in confronting her mortality, and it actually helped formulate a theoretical end to her book, which she tells to Tom. writing. It's all done except the last chapter. I want you to help me. How? Finish it. Finish it. I don't know how it ends. You do. You will. Stop. Remember Moses Morales? Who? The Mayan guide I told you about. From your trip? Yeah. The last night I was with him, he told me about his father, who had died. But Moses wouldn't believe it. Yes. No, no, listen. He said, if they dug his father's body up, he would be gone. They'd planted a seed over his grave. The seed became a tree. Moses said his father became part of that tree. He grew into the wood, into the bloom. And when a sparrow ate the tree's fruit, his father flew with the birds. He said, death was his father's road to awe. That's what he called it. The road to awe. Now, I've been trying to write the last chapter and I haven't been able to get that out of my head. Why are you done? I'm not afraid anymore, Tommy. I asked Lily if I could be buried at our farm. No, oh, stop it. Izzy is ready for death, but Tom doesn't want to let her go. This is where the science fiction really comes into play and helps with um, the acceptance of death. Tom eventually finds a way to lengthen his life and while he's traveling to the nebula that Izzy was telling him about with, um, with a sickly tree that I assume to be Izzy, this will make sense later. I assume that the work he was doing with the monkeys in the beginning of the show is how Tom was actually able to extend his life for what appears to be about 500 years. He slowly eats bits of the Tree of Life to maintain his own life. Uh, while traveling to the nebula in the hope of curing himself and the tree by gaining immortality. Don't worry. We'll be alright. I just need to take a little... The tree keeps repeating the same phrase over and over. Finish it. To which Tom replies that he doesn't know how. 
At the end of this trip, the tree dies before reaching its destination, and Tom finds that his enlightenment occurred when he finally accepts his debt. Finally, we get into the um, magical realism that is depicted in the show. Which is actually shown more during the Conquistador's timeline, although it is present in certain scenes in space. Tomas is on a quest to retrieve the sap of the Tree of Immortality, and upon reaching his destination, he puts some of the sap on his wound and it heals. Then he drinks the sap, thinking that it would be his key to immortality. But the sap actually ends up causing a bushel of flowers to start growing out of his skin. In his quest for immortal life, he loses his humanity and is actually killed to give birth to new life. I believe that when we see the Conquistador, we're actually seeing Izzy's book being played out. And the overlap that we see of Astro Tom and Tomas is actually the ending that Tom wrote for Izzy's book. However, Izzy's book was based on actual research, so I do believe that the tree particles that Tom was using for his experiments was actually the Mayan tree of life. As it was stated, they were from a strange tree that was located in Guatemala, and at the end of the film, we see Tom planting a seed that looks similar to the ones found on the tree that Tomas drinks from. If the seed was from the Tree of Life and Tom planted it on Izzy's grave, it could have made her into the new Tree of Life. Since we see the one Tomas drank from die, it would make sense as to why Izzy's tree is seen dying 500 years later and why eating parts of the tree keeps Tom alive for such a long time. When we hear the tree say... It could be Izzy prompting Tom to accept death as a part of life and to let her finally find her peace and to join her in the afterlife. We can assume that Tom has already finished her book since it's been roughly 500 years and the tree is constantly repeating this and it only stops after it dies. And Tom follows shortly after when the nebula he is in starts to die itself. His death actually depicts the image that we saw earlier when Izzy was reading from the um, Mayan book that was in the museum. Look, explains the creation. Do you see that's first father? He's the very first human. Mm, is he dead? He sacrificed himself to make the world. That's the tree of life bursting out of his stomach. Hey, come. Listen. His body became the tree's roots. They spread and formed the earth. His soul became the branches rising up, forming the sky. All that remained was first father's head. His children hung it in the heavens, creating Shibalba. Shibalba? The star? The nebula? So what do you think? About? That idea. Death as an act of creation. This ending actually leaves us with the thought that Tom reaches some afterlife with Izzy, and this allows them to be together. <laughs> The fact that 
tree of life even comes to an end as and is reborn after Tom dies shows that nothing can live forever. Death is a fundamental part of life, but it allows for beautiful creation, like Izzy's books and the flowers that we all love to look at. They're beautiful because they're here for a limited amount of time. 